Welcome to the GPS ITK surveying workshop. Today we're going to learn how to obtain topographic elevations with uh, survey grade GPS units. And this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about what GPS is, what RTK is, and a little bit of the theory behind uh, how we get a solution. But it's not going to go too deep into the theory. This is more of a hands on applied class. So we're going to spend the first segment in here learning about the material and then we're actually going to go out to memory mall and obtain some elevations and and set up a base to rover rtk system out there and you're going to collect some points and then we're going to come back in i'm going to upload those points into arcgis and we'll display them on the screen so you can see actually the, the points you obtained okay so gps this is a very common term. Everybody has a GPS in their smartphone or some people you know, have them in their car. And it stands for Global Positioning System. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a satellite positioning system and it's maintained by the United States Air Force. It has 27 satellites with a 12 hour orbit. So that means wherever you're standing, each satellite will pass over your head twice in a day. So every 12 hours, it'll pass over your head, okay? So if we have the Earth These satellites are orbiting at different orbital planes. and they form a constellation of satellites over the Earth's surface. Usually three of the satellites are inactive at any given time. So 24 satellites are what you have available to you. Now, a term that's often used in conjunction with GPS, or sometimes interchangeably, is GNSS, right? So this stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. So GNSS is a international system. So it contains the United States GPS system. So if we're being real specific, GPS only refers to the 27 satellite constellation operated by the United States. However, GNSS, the term, hasn't really caught on yet, so people often say G GPS when they really mean GNSS. Okay. So in addition to GPS, we also have another constellation named GLONASS and that's operated by Russia. We have Galileo operated by the European Union and which is operated by China. The Chinese one has a Chinese name, but it roughly translates in English to compass, right? So the GNSS constellation is made up of these four 
um, individual constellations. So at the manufacturing level, your device that you actually hold in your hand, your GPS receiver, is set up to either read only GPS or it's if it's more advanced, it's set up to read GNSS, which means it can get positions from any of these satellites. So GNSS is obviously superior to just GPS because you'll have more satellites in the sky that you can connect to. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Yes. Yep. So, how do we get a position from GPS, from a satellite? Well, the satellites emit a message, a radio message. Each satellite emits a message. Okay, and that message is unique to that particular satellite. Okay, and that is what we refer to as the GPS signal. So this signal has multiple parts to it. First of all, there is the course or what we call the acquisition code. This is a very simple, easy to decipher um, pseudo random number, all right? Or for short, we call it a. So it's basically a string of numbers that appears to be random, but it isn't. It's random enough so that it can't be mistaken for anything else, but it's not random in the sense that it's random each time it's generated. Each satellite, so we can, each satellite has its own PRN. So it sends this signal out and your receiver picks it up. The reason why this is simple is because the first thing your handheld or survey grade GPS device has to do is determine what satellites are visible. It has to know exactly which ones it can see up in the sky. So that's why we call this the acquisition code. So this might tell you that, so, If this is your handheld GPS, it might say, okay, it might tell you that it can see those four satellites overhead because it picked up their course acquisition codes. Okay, does that make sense? So it's reading the signal and it knows that, okay, these satellites are here. The next, is the precision code. This is also a PRN. And this is used for ranging, meaning computing the distance between yourself and the satellite. So right now, all you know is which satellites you can hear and approximately how far away from those satellites you are, okay? Also, this is encrypted. So this is also a pseudo-random number, 
but it's significantly longer than this one. Okay, this one is relatively short, it just identifies the satellite. This one is considerably longer, and by once your GPS note unit knows which satellite it's connecting to, it knows what pseudo-random number to expect. So, let's say it expects this pseudo-random number, and by the time that satellite reaches you, you're getting a number that looks something like this. So we see that the GPS receiver is able to say, okay, here is the start of the pseudo-random number code, okay? So this matches this, but it's shifted by two digits, and that allows them to compute the distance between you and the satellite. Okay, so this radio signal's coming in containing this information. So how far the handheld has to shift that pseudo-random number indicates how far away the satellite is from you. Okay, does that make sense? I have a question. That 12 goes first at the in, in the receiver or this what? is a this is a continuous stream. So this stream of numbers oh, okay. is just streaming streaming out there. And it's really, really long. This is I just drew the short so I could do it. But it's a really, really, really long pseudo-random number string. So that's all one number? Yeah, this would be its pseudo-random number string, except it would be uh, maybe even an order of magnitude longer than this. I'm just using a short version to demonstrate. So this comes in, and it has to shift it by some finite amount in order to line it up with the stream. And then the difference between how, how far the GPS unit has to shift it in time indicates how long the signal took to get there. And coupled with the wavelength or the frequency of the signal, you can compute the distance between the two. Does that make more sense? What's that? Yes, it's continually streaming yeah it's sending out this group of numbers over and over and over again that's all it does that part of the satellite just continually sends out that string of numbers so, the so it, it sends it out and then it sends it out again and then again and then again so the name should be only to a break point that part L. Yeah. yes well it's two it's two, two, number. Okay. two yeah it's two two numbers so two numbers if it has to shift by two numbers that can tell you the time difference or the time it took that data to leave the satellite and reach you and then that can compute from that you can compute from the frequency of the signal you can compute the length the next part however now all you know is the length right so you still aren't sure where exactly the satellite is in the sky. So the third part of the signal is known as the navigation message. So first is the GPS date and time. The clock on the GPS is really, when you when it boils down to it, the most important 
component of the GPS. Okay? The clock and managing time is by far the most important link in the GPS system. So it contains the GPS date and time and also the status of the satellite. Is it detecting any onboard problems with its systems? So it sends down the navigation message and has this and this. The second component is what's known as the ephemeris data. This is used to compute the satellite position. And three is known as the almanac. And that contains information about the constellation itself. So the constellation represents the collection of satellites. So if you're connecting to a GPS satellite, it's only going to tell you about the GPS constellation. If you're connecting to a GLONASS satellite, it'll tell you information about the other GLONASS satellites. So this helps you connect to other satellites. So you get the course acquisition code, you see you're connected to satellite 23. You get the ranging code and the navigation message. Meanwhile, this is looking for other acquisition codes. However, once you download the Almanac, the GPS receiver will know roughly what other satellites should be in the sky at the same time. Because this one told it to, oh, based on where you are, you should also look for satellites 18, 7, and 9. Those are probably in the sky. So that helps shorten the acquisition time that you start getting a true position. Okay? So to draw our globe again, here's a person standing on the Earth's surface holding a GPS. So we have one satellite here that emits the signal. And we know its position and the length. So that means we can be really anywhere inside a circle around that. That's why you need to connect to multiple satellites in order to further narrow down your position. So normally the number is you need at least three satellites for a reasonably accurate horizontal position. You need at least four for a vertical position. All right. How many horizontal? Three. Minimum of three. The more satellites you get, the smaller the area you could possibly be in gets. So it shrinks the more satellites you have. The more position and ranges you have, you know, each of these circles, it makes a smaller and smaller spot where you could be. So these signals are transmitted on two primary carrier frequencies. Now there have been um, in recent years some advanced upgrades to Processing the satellites from the uh, processing the signals from the satellites, but these are the two primary ones that you see referenced. The first one is called L1.
that's transmitted at 1575.42 megahertz. So if you see, if you go to try to buy a GPS unit, right, if you go to Bass Pro Shops and pick up a handheld GPS unit, most of the time it's going to be a single frequency receiver or a single band. That means that it's only listening or it only has the hardware to listen to the L1 signal. So all this information is transmitted over this radio signal. The other one is L2. And that's transmitted at 1227.60 megahertz. So some receivers, in fact, almost all survey grade receivers are what they call dual frequency receivers, meaning they can hear both of these sounds. Okay, both of these signals can be interpreted by the receiver. So why is the two channels more accurate? They're both carrying the same information. If you look at the ranges that you get from each signal, right? So you're gonna get, actually, L1, L1 contains the course acquisition code, and then both of them contain the precision code and the navigation message. If you analyze the difference, you can get information about the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere significantly affects the GPS signal. Okay, if it's really cloudy, if it's raining, if we're having solar weather, all of that affects how long it takes these signals to get to your receiver from the satellite. So, these, your hardware has built-in corrections for atmospheric conditions. Okay, so if you just have a single frequency receiver, all you're getting is that signal and it's relatively uncorrected for atmospheric conditions. It's corrected, but only for sort of average, average conditions. It's not getting any real-time information. The survey grade, a dual frequency receiver, you can compare these two signals and infer information about the atmosphere and develop more accurate corrections. So just in general, a single frequency receiver probably gets you somewhere between 1 to 10 meters in accuracy. So under absolutely perfect conditions, it may get you within a meter of your true location. However, it could be as bad as up to 10 meters of your true location. Now, dual frequency receivers can get you into sub-meter range without any external correction scheme. Okay. Any questions on that? Uh, cell, phone, cell phone GPS is L1? Yes, cell phone GPSs are single frequency GPSs. Now, cell phone GPSs are unique in that most of them also use a Wi-Fi signal to help determine your position. So, they, by connecting to the Wi-Fi network, they can further reduce the uncertainty in your position. So. That it particularly helps when you're indoors, but most of the time you're just getting a position from L1. So if you're looking at Google Maps on your smartphone, you also have a correction algorithm where it knows that you're moving at a certain velocity. So the software can tell that, oh, you have to be driving. There's no way anybody could walk 60 miles an hour. So then 
it analyzes the roadways that are nearby. And you might appear to be just to the right of a roadway in the woods. So the software senses that and corrects you back onto the road because it knows that, okay, there's a very, very high probability that you're actually right on this roadway, heading this way. So it, it sort of, it uses a machine learning approach and bumps you over to your correct position. And then it, but the good part about that is it also stores that correction. So other people driving nearby using Google Maps will also get corrected over. All right, it's pretty neat. Okay, so that is as far as I'm gonna go with the nuts and bolts of GPS. This is really all you need to know to operate a GPS unit. Okay, so I hope you know a little bit more now than you did before you got here about how this system works. So now we're gonna talk about correcting the GPS signal and making it accurate to less than half a meter and then eventually into the centimeter range. Okay. So corrected GPS generally has a few different what we call modes. The first one is called autonomous. So this means that you are only receiving information from the satellites. So it's a relatively uncorrected scheme, right? Only information from the satellites. So in autonomous, more satellites equals more accuracy. Again, you need to have greater than three to get any horizontal position and or greater than or equal to three, greater than or equal to four to get a vertical position. So the more satellites you have, the more accurate it is, but without at least three, you will not have a horizontal position whatsoever. And without four, you cannot get a vertical position. It's just, it's impossible. So in autonomous, your vertical position is probably on the order of three to five meters. Now keep in mind, autonomous in this sense is still dual frequency, okay? So from this point forward, we're really talking about dual frequency receivers because that's the only types of receivers that are used in land surveying, modern land surveying. So even with dual frequency, your vertical position can still be off by a significant amount. So you've heard me reference now the term position multiple times. position is really the coordinates of your location. So one of the most common coordinate systems is latitude, longitude. So your latitude and longitude is okay, the prime meridian 
is you'll notice that the latitude lines are sort of concentric about the sphere. The longitude lines all end at the poles. So they all have the same starting and ending point. Okay? So in order to make relative measurements, we have to designate one of these as zero. And that one is known as the, what's called the prime meridian. Most notably, it runs through Greenwich, England. Right? That's why zero time is often referred to as Greenwich mean time. Okay? Because the longitude as the Earth rotates determines the time zones. So the prime meridian, anything east of that is measured in east longitude, and anything west of that, west longitude. A lot of times, too, you'll see latitude and longitude reported in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So each degree is divided into 60 minutes, just like a clock. And each minute is divided into 60 seconds. So that would be UCS coordinates in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So this is known as a spherical coordinate system. It's sort of the base coordinate system for GPS and positioning in general. We also have Cartesian projections that are sort of coordinate systems that give you x and y coordinates. So those are in distances from an origin. Okay, so while these are angles that describe your position on the mathematical ellipsoid that describes the Earth, these Cartesian projections are simply, so if you are here, you have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, okay? These are typically referred to as northings and eastings. So the origin is zero, zero, and each coordinate system has their own, its own origin. So this coordinate might be at this coordinate, which means it's 10,123 meters north of the origin and 459,344 meters east of the origin. So there are many, many types of Cartesian projection systems. The Universal Transverse Mercator, or UTM, is one. That one divides the Earth into um, sort of stripes going from north to south called UTM zones. And each UTM zone has, its, has an origin. In the United States, one of the most common, especially in construction and engineering, are what's known as state plane coordinate systems.
So there's a very crude representation of Florida. So the problem with Cartesian systems is that you're projecting a curved surface onto a plane, right? So if here's our planar surface, each of these coordinates gets projected onto it. And then if you were looking down like this, you would see them in terms of x, y. So the larger your Cartesian system is, the more of the Earth's curvature is taken out or is sort of smoothed out of that projection. So you don't want to use a Cartesian system on an area too big, right? If you've ever tried to see the Earth, for example, on the map in the back of the room, just trying to see the Earth plotted on a piece of paper, it's distorted because it's actually a spherical type shape. So therefore, these coordinate systems are all designed to minimize that projection error. So for state plane, the larger states like Florida, Alaska, California, Texas, they all have their state broken into multiple zones, right? So Florida has, for example, three zones, Florida East, Florida West, and Florida North. And each one of these has an origin, and all state plane coordinates in that, in that state plane region are measured from that origin. I don't know that that's really where the origin is, but you get the point. So most of the time when you're doing RTK or GPS surveying, you're working in a state plane coordinate system okay because you're doing it for a job of some kind and typically you're doing it on a small enough area where the Cartesian system is a lot easier okay any questions up till that point okay about the UPM yes you tell, uh, the how many zones is there because I can see in here there are some difference between the uh, DPM and second and UPM that time it doesn't match properly The UTM are they're divided in the UTM zones are divided into two classes, north and south. Okay, okay so draw another. Here's the equator. So we have all of the north UTM zones and all of the south UTM zones. So you have to specify what zone you're in, north or south. So then you have a UTM zone that looks something like this. So this might be zone 16 and 17. Those two cover the state of Florida. I do a lot of work in both of them. So this right here would be UTM 16 North, right? I think there are, and you know, these this is a global system, so we have 18, 19, honestly I can't remember how many actual UTM zones there are. 14? 40. 40. Yeah, 40 UTM zones. Okay, so this is 60 and this is 40, right? In here, it should be 60. 60 don't mean, you know, okay, total is 360. Yes. Okay, 360, so yeah. here is 40, so of course there are some difference, so that's why maybe Yes, yeah, so yeah, there are 360 longitudinal meridians, right? Really only, you only usually refer to 180 of them as either 180 west or 180 east. Good question. And every state and territory in the U.S. has its own state plane system. And you have to be very, very careful about using these systems and making sure that you're in the correct length unit because you know there is a state plane Florida East in meters and there's a state plane Florida East in feet. And if you confuse the two, your data is going to be extremely off. Okay. 
So you've heard the word frequently, RTK, and that was actually on the advertising. This is a correction technique that stands for real time kinematic. So real time means that you're getting corrections that are delivered directly to your handheld in the field as you're doing the surveying. The opposite of real time is post-processed. So sometimes you can collect data in the field and then go back into your office and make all the corrections. That's called post-processed. However, real time means you're getting accurate data while you're doing the survey. Kinematic means that you don't have to stay at each point for very long. Okay, you can take your measurement, move to the next one, take your measurement, move to the next one, take your measurement. This is opposed to static GPS surveying where you set up your receiver on a point and leave it there for hours and hours and hours and let it continually receive GPS signal. And the longer you leave it there, the smaller your uncertainty of your position gets. Okay? So this actually works slightly different than just the L1, L2 navigation and precision code message that I mentioned previously. This actually me measures the carrier phase as well as the precision code. So remember we had that pseudo random number where it shifts that signal to line up the pseudo random number. That is one way to do it. The second way to do it is to actually measure the difference in the carrier, the phase of the frequency, the carrier, oh, I'm sorry, it was over there, the frequency of the carrier phase, okay? So based on the GPS time that we receive from the satellite, we should know exactly well, we have this signal, and then we have, when we received it, is right here. So we have to shift it backwards in order to make it line up with the expected carrier phase. And this right here can also tell us the time it took to get from the satellite, which allows us to compute the length for us to the satellite. So RTK uses both the PRN and carrier phase measurements. Now, we can see that, how do we know that this should go back to here or from here to here, right? It's, how do we know which signal to move it back to line it up? This is by a statistical technique that's hard-coded into the receiver. So it knows exactly how to align these signals in order to compute the distance. Because it can do all this, It requires special receiver hardware. So you need, if you were to purchase one of these, you have to make sure it's capable of RTK. Because not all GPS receivers can analyze the carrier phase. Okay, it's, of course, every time you, when you go from single frequency to dual frequency, it's more expensive. And then dual frequency with RTK is even more expensive. So how this works is you 
have a a base station that remains fixed. So you set up a base station and it stays there and does not move. It serves as a fixed point in space. Now, you can put this over a known point where you know the coordinates from actual land surveying, or you can read this the position of this point from GPS. So you have a, a fixed base station that continually receives data. And then you have a person carrying a GPS a G or a GPS RTK unit and they are known as the rover. So they move. So the person holding the rover does the actual land surveying. So the base station, it knows its true position. Right? Most of the time we set this up over a known point. So we you know, this is a mark on the ground that's set specifically and has been surveyed and leveled in, so we know its exact position. So we know its true position. And we also know its satellite position, because this is a GPS receiver. It's receiving signals from the satellite and computing its satellite position. So there is a delta between these two. So we have the true position and the position it's receiving from the satellite. And that those positions are different because of atmospheric conditions, um, just the, the systematic error in the equipment itself. All of those things combine to make these two positions a little bit different. Right? So this is where your inaccuracy comes in. However, since this is set up on a known position, we know the delta. And this base station broadcasts that delta to all the rovers. So the rovers get their rovers are getting their satellite position and then they apply that delta and get their true position or something close to their true position. Does that make sense? So there's a limit to the amount of distance between your base station and your rover at which these corrections apply. If you get too far away from your base station, you may not be um, you may not be experiencing the same atmospheric conditions as the base station. Okay, So the further you get away from this, the less accurate it gets. In general, a rule of thumb is two parts per million accuracy. Okay, So if you were a million centimeters from the base station, your position is going to be off by two, or you're going to your your position is going to degrade by two centimeters. Or if you're a million meters, it'll be two meters, but a million meters is a long way. So that's the general rule of thumb for distance from the base station. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to set up a base station right on a known point, and then you guys are each going to get a or work in teams of two and get a rover and take some measurements, okay? However, because this type of surveying is so prevalent, there are actually permanent base stations that have been built in locations all around the world. Um, in the US, we have a, a big network in Florida of permanent of satellite data recorded. So you can get extremely accurate positions on the permanent base stations. 
and they're built, they're attached to concrete poles set in the ground or on top of structures like parking garages that never move, okay? So this system right here is known as single base, okay? So single base means there's one base station broadcasting corrections. Another way to do it is with network or virtual reference station, VRS corrections. So if you're connecting to a network of fixed base stations, sometimes you can actually interpolate based on multiple stations and you'll get corrections from multiple different points and that sort of gives you a much better indicator of the error from the atmosphere and how to correct for it. So in this case, the base station is going to broadcast a radio signal. It's a UHF radio signal. I think it's 400 hertz, something like that. However, you can also connect to a permanent network via cellular modem. So you can actually put a cell phone SIM card into your receiver and it connects to the internet through the cellular network, connects to a server that's broadcasting these corrections and you send your position to the server and it sends the corrections back to you in real time through a cellular network. Also, if you have Wi-Fi nearby, you can do it that way as well. You just have to connect to the cellular network to get your corrections. This is what we normally do in the field, because where we do a lot of research, there are no fixed points for us to set up, set up on. So we use the cellular modem to connect to the network. Right. Couple more and then we'll go outside. This network contains multiple what we call cores. This stands for Continuously Operating Reference Station. And this is convenient because in, if you have access to a network, you only need a rover you don't need a base station. Okay, so having a base station, first of all, you have to buy two RTK capable receivers, so that's more expensive. And secondly, you have set up a base station, and if you're working by yourself, you have to leave the base station alone at this point. So it can be stolen, it can be vandalized, it can be hit by a truck, you know, all sorts of things. So connecting to the network allows you to only have a rover, which is nice. However, you're relying that the network is up and accessible. Okay, so if you lose cell service, you don't get corrections anymore. If the network servers have a problem, you don't get corrections anymore. If one of these stations goes down, you might not get corrections anymore. So it's, it's a trade-off. If you bring your own base station, it's nice, it'll always work, but again, you have those other issues to deal with. The network we use a lot is the Florida Permanent Reference Network. Florida Permanent Reference Network. This is maintained by the Florida Department of Transportation. Okay. 
and it's freely accessible. All you have to do uh, is yes. register. And yes. you have to register each piece of equipment that will be connecting to the network. So each piece of equipment, you create a special username and password for. And then when you're using this equipment, you log in to, you know, you put your username and password and the IP address of the server into your GPS unit. And then it connects with the server and starts receiving the stream. OK. So in the event that you do not have a known point to set up on, which happens a lot, you have an alternative. You can set up the base station anywhere and just start reading GPS from that point. And it'll slowly and slowly and slowly get to a highly accurate point. This is if you're at an unknown point. And then, with your rover, you can check in and make measurements at a few other known points and do a process called localization. So what this does is you might not know exactly where the base station is, but you can establish points and you usually try to, uh, if your surveying job is in here, you want to try to bound your surveying job with known points. So you obtain positions at these four points and the software will correct your position and allow you to get accurate corrections from the base station based on this localization scheme that you've established. So you can either set your base station up on a known point or an unknown point, but if you set it up on an unknown point, you need to check in with multiple localization points, okay? I just want you to know kind of both ways that this is done. Okay, the final topic is since we're doing RTK topographic surveying, we need to know how to interpret the different types of heights and elevations we get from the GPS. And this is extremely important. GPS returns what's known as the ellipsoid height, okay? The ellipsoid is a mathematical representation of the Earth as a flattened sphere. Okay, so if we have north and south, this is kind of exaggerated, but the Earth is represented mathematically as a flattened sphere. So we have a semi-minor axis and a semi-major axis. So one of the most common is the geodetic reference system of 1980. So you'll see this abbreviated as GRS-80. You probably, if you've done work in GIS, you've probably seen this come up. So for GRS-80, A is 6,378,137 meters. B is 6,356,745 meters. 
three one four four three one four one four zero oh, three meters. So you can see it's almost a perfect sphere. These aren't much different from each other at all. So when you get a elevation or a height from your GPS unit, it is in the ellipsoid height. Now why is that important? Is the Earth's surface a perfect ellipsoid? Is it perfectly smooth? No, not even close, right? You have mountains, you have valleys, you have all kinds of terrain. So let's zoom in on, let's just say, a little piece of the Earth right here. Not Florida. Yeah, not Florida. So we have a perfectly smooth section of the ellipsoid, right? So the ellipsoid is always a perfect shell. Then we also have the actual ground surface. Right? And that could be any type of terrain. You are standing right there with your GPS receiver, and you're going to get a horizontal position, right? So that position where you are on the ellipsoid, and it's going to return a height. That is a distance from the ellipsoid. Okay, so we call this little h. However, the ellipsoid is not a valid datum from which to reference. Most of the time, we reference a what we call an orthometric datum. That is usually based on mean sea level, right? MSL, mean sea level. So depending on your region, you will have a localized vertical datum from which all your elevations are measured. How do we develop these datums, right? We typically establish a control point and call that zero, or the mean sea level in that location we're going to say is zero. So in recent, relatively recent history, there have been two vertical datums in North America. National Geodetic Vertical Datum of 1929. that was a least squares adjustment of mean sea level at 26 tide stations located on the east and west coast of the United States and Canada. And then the North American vertical datum of 1988. This is the one most commonly used. And this one, since it's newer, how many tide stations do you think it uh, factors in. Can you guess? Yeah. 
almost everybody thinks that we would do more. But no, the NABD 88 is, is referenced to one single tide station. And that is in Quebec, Canada. So in order to establish the distance or your height above this NABD 88, we need to apply what's known as a a geoid model. Okay, so this ellipsoid is a mathematical, a mathematically perfect ellipse, three-dimensional ellipse. The geoid is based on gravitational measurements. Take it all over the Earth. So from that, we get a geoid model that serves as the datum, but it's also varying. North America, the ellipsoid is above the geoid, but in other places in the world, the geoid can be above the ellipsoid. Okay, so th these aren't always like this. Okay, they, they vary, just like the ground surface sometimes goes below the ellipsoid. So what we really want to know is our elevation this value right here, our elevation above the geoid. That's what we want to know. So how we do that is our GPS unit gives us our horizontal position and our height above the ellipsoid. Okay, so this can be either positive or negative because we can be below the ellipsoid and it would be negative. And then what we do is we apply a geoid model. The current one is geoid 12A. So it was last built in or uses data from 2012. So as we get better gravitational measurements, they keep updating the geoid model. So the geoid model plus our horizontal position gives us our geoid height and that is this distance right here so if we know our position we can draw a line and, and we can calculate the distance between the ellipsoid and the geoid so our elevation or height above the datum is equal to little h minus n. So see in this case n is negative because it's below the ellipsoid. So it would be little h minus negative n would give us big H, and that's the height above the datum. So to do this, and rather than bring the entire geoid model of the Earth out in the field with us, the software allows us to sort of cut out a little piece of the geoid in the area of our job. Now, I've already done that, and that geoid model is on your data collectors. It has a, an extension .gsf. So it tells you the undulations and the contours of this geoid. Typically you choose a point in the center of your job and say give me everything with, within 10 kilometers of that point or something to that effect. Okay, any questions on determining your height? Do you 
page. Over, like, the, the H is equal to little h minus n. So where, what is, what is it? It's from the geo to the left side? Yes. So based on your horizontal position, right, you know this point. Mm -hmm. This h you read from your GPS. N you derive from the geoid model. So the geoid model is a really a series of horizontal positions and their corresponding ends. And it interpolates your distance from the geoid or your height from the geoid from the ellipsoid to the geoid based on that model. So would it be no, in this case, n is negative. See, it's measured downward from the ellipsoid, or it's always measured directly from the ellipsoid. So in this case, it's below it. That's why it would be little h minus negative n. Or not negative n, but it would be a negative value. So if your geoid was up here, n would be this way, and your you'd be reading this from the GPS, you would subtract this to get that elevation. Okay? But it's crucial that you understand this. Okay? Because when we set up the base station, we're going to set it up over a a long lat and ellipsoid height. We're going to program those three things in. Okay? On the rover, we're going to be using state plane coordinates and the geoid height. So the geoid is applied at the rover, not at the base station. Okay, the base station, you put your lawn, your lat, and your ellipsoid height. And then on your rover, you're going to be reading state plane coordinates, and you can set that to whatever you want. It projects it on the fly. But you apply your geoid model at the rover level. Okay. Now, theoretically, you could go out with your rover and record all ellipsoid heights. And then back at the office, you could apply the geoid model and get your true measurements. However, while you were out in the field, you would be looking at the ellipsoid heights, which can be wildly different from your true orthometric heights. Does that make sense? So that's why we apply the geoid on the data collector. Any questions before we go outside? Yes. Good question. I haven't really mentioned that. Um, so your GPS under the best possible conditions will give you accuracy of three to five meters horizontally and three to five vertically, okay? So this is not good enough for any water resources modeling or certainly not for construction or anything that we do. Uh, with an RTK, so with a base station and a rover, your horizontal is about two centimeters, and your vertical is about four centimeters of accuracy. So you're getting a position, you know, within this much height that's accurate to within that much, and then your horizontal position is accurate to within <laughs> that much. Whereas if you just use your GPS, your uncertainty is much, much larger. Yeah. This is usually what I mentioned first, but I skipped right over it. Okay. You skipped over. You, you said autonomous, but you didn't say about the other two modes. Okay, yeah. Um, when you're using RTK in the field, 
there are three situations you could find yourself in. Autonomous, meaning you're reading from the satellite only. Okay, no corrections. So you're not, for some reason, you cannot communicate with your base station or base stations. So your device will say autonomous on it. And most of the time, it will not allow you to, end, to log a point, to record a point if you're in autonomous mode because you're not meeting the accuracy requirements. Slightly better is known as float mode. So this is sat plus corrections. However, so you're getting data from the satellite, you're getting communications from the base station. However, the rover does not see, does not have enough satellites in common with the base station. So when they both look up to the sky, they have to be seeing a certain number of the same satellites. Because if the, the base station is receiving corrections from 21, 22, 23, and 24, the rover has to be able to see those same satellites in order for those corrections to be valid. Right? So if they don't have enough stations in common, you'll be in float mode. And the goal is to get to fixed mode, meaning and so you, you have satellites and you're getting legitimate corrections because you have enough sats in common. Typically, when you turn on all your equipment, you'll start off in autonomous mode. It'll start talking to the base station and you'll progress down into float mode. And then you'll go to fixed mode and it'll make a happy beep, you know, like a happy ding sound that tells you that you're, you're getting good measurements. So again, and you'll also see on your data collector, it displays the standard deviation of your measurement stream. So if your position is changing by you know, if it's changing a lot, like meaning you take a measurement at one second, and then the next se second, your measurement's five meters away, and then your next second, your measurement's one meter away. So it keeps, it keeps a running average and standard deviation of those. So it'll go from three to five to approximately one to about two centimeters. So you're standard deviation will progress down to this and then eventually you'll be you'll have a good standard deviation okay so at this point let's go ahead and head outside and get some hands-on experience with the equipment in ArcGIS to use the 3D Analyst Toolbox. <clears throat> Conversion from file. So what I did was I exported the points you surveyed into an ASCII text file. navigate to that file.
so it's in XYZ format, and So that's going to convert it from an XYZ text file into a ArcGIS feature class. So there are all of your points. But let's add a base map give them some context. So this is going to load an aerial photo in the background. And we should see the exact locations of our points. exactly where they were. I know the first one we did was where we set up the tripod, right down there. So there are all of your points and remember that this one was the stormwater inlet. So we can also um, <coughs> manipulate this by creating a surface from that. So is going to interpolate a little contour map from that. So you can see that it's much lower on the, I guess this would be the southeast corner. Sorry, much higher at the southeast corner. Yeah. yeah. And its lowest point is predictably right at that stormwater inlet. So everything drains down toward that stormwater inlet and it's highest up over here. Pretty neat, huh? So this is what we do when we go out in the field and uh, hope you all benefited from this and learned something new, either about GPS or how to squeeze the thing with your thumbs. So thank you for coming and good luck. <laughs>